Hi folks, this is your snow day lesson and it's um, about snow and other kinds of precipitation, clouds and um, storms. So uh, we start off this week with uh, the two theories about how clouds form precipitation and it begins to fall. Uh, the first theory is the Bergeron process and this is believed to occur in cold clouds. So clouds that are below the freezing point of water, 32 Fahrenheit or 0 Celsius. Uh, the Bergeron process <clears throat> occurs in clouds that are made of ice because they're cold. So you have ice crystals and as water vapor hits those ice crystals, it freezes. Um, and so those ice crystals grow in size until uh, they are too heavy to remain suspended in the air so they begin to fall. Um, as those ice crystals fall, um, then they may even grow more and more, uh, and they begin to leave the cloud uh, as precipitation. In this case, they're still frozen. But as they descend through the troposphere, of course, you know that it gets warmer as you come out of the cloud and move down closer to Earth. And um, eventually, these uh, will often melt and become rain, although they could uh, also possibly remain as snow if the troposphere stays cold. Uh, but generally they'll fall, they'll melt, then they will uh, become rain. So, um, the Bergeron process, cold clouds. Um, the other theory of precipitation is the cloud um, collision coalescence process. So you know that um, the way that water vapor um, condenses in a cloud uh, requires some dust particles called cloud condensation nuclei. We learned about that the day that we um, tried to make a cloud in the bottle and we had to put some smoke in the bottle first so that there were cloud condensation nuclei for the water vapor to condense on. And then uh, through adiabatic cooling when the bottle expanded the cloud formed, remember? So uh, the cloud uh, or I mean the collision coalescence process is where there are cloud um, uh, condensation nuclei present in the cloud and so water vapor begins to um, to what's the word I want uh, condense upon it and then uh, this happens in warm clouds above the freezing point of water so the water vapor condenses into liquid water around the cloud condensation nuclei then, um, cloud, uh, you know, clouds have wind, uh, air currents, so these droplets get moved around, and if they collide with other droplets, you also learned before that water likes to cling to itself. Water droplets will cling to other water droplets because of the little attractive forces within water. We learned about hydrogen bonding and, um, so you know that water likes to cling to itself. So if water droplets in a cloud collide, they tend to stick together. Um, they have surface tension and they don't like to be pulled apart. So those droplets, of course, collide, stick together, and become larger and larger until they are too large to remain suspended in the cloud. And then similarly to the Bergeron process, they begin to fall. In this case, though, they're already liquid water. Um, so uh, there comes a point when they just are too large to remain and they fall. Um, different types of precipitation uh, often are uh, named based on their size. So drizzle, for example, is uh, basically the same thing as rain, except that the size of each drop is very, very tiny, and the droplets tend to be evenly spaced, so they're almost like a haze or cloud in the air, falling very slowly, very evenly spaced, and they're very tiny droplets, um, about half a millimeter in size, so tiny, tiny. Uh, whereas raindrops tend to be larger, about two millimeters in size or larger. Um, so drizzle, rain, you know what rain is. Um, also, there uh, are a few other types of precipitation that we kind of have seen this week. Um, sleet. Uh, sleet is uh, going to come from cold clouds, of course. Um, and then um, as raindrops fall through the troposphere, if they hit a layer of cold air, 
um, especially if there's cold air near the ground, because you know cold air tends to sink, uh, they can freeze. So liquid raindrops are falling, they refreeze in a cold layer of air and they form sleet. Um, so this would be basically frozen raindrops, little ice pellets. And we, I think actually saw that maybe last Tuesday when we were leaving class, maybe. Um, so little, uh, not snowflakes, but like ice pellets, that would be sleet. Uh, this is different from freezing rain. Freezing rain falls as liquid water. And then it, uh, when it uh, lands on a surface uh, and that uh, rain is already very close to the freezing point and the surface that it lands on, maybe a handrail, sidewalk, road, building, uh, what have you, if that surface is colder than the freezing point of water and the raindrop is nearly at the freezing point, then it will lose energy to the cold surface, causing that water to freeze in a very uh, smooth layer of ice, so that's very dangerous to walk on. So freezing rain falls as rain and then doesn't freeze until it strikes an actual surface. Um, hail uh, may be difficult to tell from sleet, uh, but you can tell if you take a hailstone and cut it up um, hail actually forms in cumulonimbus clouds, cold clouds, and um, there are updrafts in those clouds, which are um, just air currents that go up. So, of course, you know as you go through the troposphere uh, and you head upward, it gets colder. So, updrafts can carry um, little ice crystals up higher into the cloud, uh, more and more layers freeze as you, uh, as the thing is carried up. It gets larger, it falls back down, or it loses the updraft and falls back down, then it catches another updraft and goes up and down and up and down, each time adding a layer. So if you cut a hailstone in half, you can actually see how many times it went up into the cloud and froze another layer, came back down, froze another layer, almost like tree rings. You can see the layers that have frozen on a hailstone. So uh, hail actually freezes within the cloud, going up and down, up and down, adding layers until it's so heavy that it can't uh, even be carried up by another updraft and so it falls as a hailstone. And that's different than uh, sleet because sleet is actually liquid water as it's falling and then it goes through a layer of cold air and freezes uh, so it doesn't have any layers. Um, so hailstones can actually get quite large if they are carried up and down multiple times, many many times. Uh, of course you all know snow. Um, snow is another form of precipitation. Uh, this would form um, and uh, fall in a similar way um, according to the Bergeron process because it has to happen in cold clouds um, and uh, those are the types of precipitation so uh, drizzle, sleet, freezing rain, hail, snow, and regular old rain. Um, two other ways that um, water vapor can leave the atmosphere and uh, re-enter the groundwater um, <clears throat> would be dew and frost. Um, we have actually quite lovely frost this morning. Look. See? Frost. Um, so, let's see. So, uh, start with dew. Dew is um, what happens uh, oftentimes early in the morning. Uh, when the temperature is right, um, you'll have the ground being colder than the air around it. So water vapor from the air will strike a blade of grass or the ground or a surface near the ground. And that surface will be cold, colder than the air temperature. And it will uh, be cold enough that it will cause that water vapor to condense uh, because, of course, you know that uh, water vapor has to have enough energy to remain a gas. If it hits something cold, it will lose energy to that object and then that loss of energy may cause it to uh, change from a gas to a liquid. So when that happens, um, you have condensation or dew on the ground. So uh, it doesn't rain and that's why the ground is wet. It's just that water vapor uh, loses energy to the colder ground or surfaces near the ground and condenses into dew. Um, in the case of frost, if you have water vapor in the air and um, the ground is cold enough, that water vapor will immediately go from uh, vapor or gas to uh, frozen. So that's how frost forms. Very similar to dew except that it's cold enough to actually freeze instantly instead of going through the liquid phase. 
Um, and the temperature at which dew or frost occurs is the dew point or the frost point. Um, so high pressure, high humidity means you're going to have a high dew point. That's something that you may want to remember for the test, but that's easy to remember. High pressure, high humidity, high dew point. Um, so then we look at thunderstorms, and I want you all to uh, try experiment 8.1. All you need is a balloon and a dark room. Uh, maybe a mirror will help uh, if you have lots of people trying to see, but you don't need a mirror. So um, go in a dark room, rub the balloon on your head. When you rub that balloon on your head, you are uh, causing the balloon, which is an insulator. The balloon is an insulator. That means that it does not conduct electrical charge well. So any electrical charge that it picks up can't really travel. So rub the balloon on your head. That area that rubbed on your head is going to collect electrons from your hair. It's actually quite easy to steal electrons from your hair, especially this time of year when it's very dry in the winter and cool. Uh, so you rub that balloon on your head, your hair will lose electrons, gain a positive charge. The balloon will gain electrons, gain a negative charge. So that's why your hair will stick up because the positive charge of the hair, since it lost electrons, uh, and the negative charge in the balloon, since it gained electrons, are opposite. And of course, opposite charges attract. But our point here is that um, once you have that negatively charged balloon, um, since the balloon is an insulator, the negative charges have nowhere to escape, so they stay on that balloon. Then if you take your knuckles and you stick them up like this, it's like a little mountain range. Um, so you have high points and low points. If you bring the negatively charged balloon near your knuckles, but don't actually touch them, um, the negative charge on that balloon is going to repel the electrons away from your hand because you know that like charges, negative charges, will repel each other. Uh, electrons can move easily. Of course, positive charges don't move easily. So um, negative charges move easily. So when the big negative thing comes near your hand, those electrons from this area are just going to go somewhere else, anywhere else. They'll just try to get away from the big negative charge because the negative charges repel each other. So your hand will take on a slight positive charge because all of its electrons left. Um, so then you've got big negative charge on the balloon, um, little positive charge on your hand, but in between those two you have air, and air is a really good insulator, like the rubber in the balloon. Air is a really good insulator, so it's very hard for those two charges to actually get together, uh, but if you come closer and closer slowly, there comes a point when um, the charge is able to force its way through the air. Now when the charge forces its way through the air, it takes a huge amount of energy to fight its way through the insulator of the air. Um, so what you get is very similar to lightning. That balloon is negative. Uh, little negative charges will start to um, come down just like the stepped leader in lightning. Um, and, then, um, and then in lightning you'll have that return stroke from the ground, which is kind of where all the power of lightning is. Uh, but uh, there comes a point when it's able to jump the gap, that insulator uh, section of air, and uh, you get like a tiny little bolt of static electricity, lightning, um, but you know, safe, not too much uh, there for your hand. Now it helps to have uh, your fist like this. Uh, when you repeat the experiment with a flat hand, um, you're much less likely to get a visible bolt of lightning because um, it's easier for uh, a stronger positive charge to build up on kind of a little uh, peak, kind of a smaller area. Um, that positive charge building up on a large flat area won't um, give enough um, power to kind of overcome the uh, gap of air there and allow the charge to jump. So when you have kind of a more concentrated uh, area where you can get the positive charge, you're more likely to see that little bolt of lightning from the balloon to your knuckle, uh, or really from your knuckle to the balloon, because the step leader comes off the balloon, but the charge will jump off your hand, basically. So you'll see the bolt. Uh, it's hard to tell which direction it goes, because it goes so fast. Um, also, the um, when it comes across, the bolt uh, is actually that huge release of energy trying to force its way through the air insulation. And um, so it superheats the air. Um, 
and that's why, of course, lightning is such a high temperature, but also that's why you hear thunder, or why you hear that tiny little snap when the um, static charge jumps, because um, when that air gets hot, as it forces through the, um, the insulation of the air, the air expands uh, when that bolt of lightning comes and it's hot. So, of course, air expands when it's hot, and as the air expands, it pushes the air around it out, and then you get kind of this shock wave of air traveling. And, of course, when those little waves hit your eardrum and make it vibrate, you hear that as a sound. So that's where the sound of thunder comes from. The air expands, and then the waves of air come through and, and hit your ear. And we'll talk more about sound waves later in the year. Uh, but you do need to know a little bit about what the sound of thunder is from the test. So there's a good video on Mrs. Hastings' site. I sent you that link uh, that you can watch that shows the, um, from a cloud, it shows the step leader coming down out of the negative cloud, and it shows the um, the return stroke uh, from the positively charged ground. Now, I disagree with the way he did it in the book. Uh, he talked about um, how the negative cloud attracts the positive charges in the ground, but that's not exactly it. Positive charges really don't move. They stay in the nucleus of their atoms. Uh, negative charges, electrons, move easily. So instead of saying that the negative cloud attracts the positive ground. It's more like the negative cloud repels negative charges away from the ground. So when all the negative electrons run away from under the cloud, you end up with a positive charge on the ground. I know that's kind of nitpicky of me, but positive charges really don't do a lot of moving. So uh, I sort of disagree with the way he words things in the book there, but you know, bear with me. Um, so, how does the negative charge form in a cloud? Well, when you have a thunderstorm, you're going to have a cumulonimbus cloud, and you know that they can get very, very tall. Um, the storm clouds can get very, very tall. You see that characteristic anvil shape that uh, you see pictures of in class, that you've seen pictures of in the book, on the videos. So, um, this very tall cloud, uh, and of course, since it's a cumulonimbus cloud, it's a cold cloud, so we're talking about the Bergeron process. And uh, you'll have um, little ice crystals moving around, crashing into things, um, having uh, more ice condense upon them until they weigh a lot, and they start to fall through the cloud. Uh, as they fall, of course, they'll bump into other ice crystals. And when they bump with a glancing blow, just like a side swipe instead of a complete collision, then they can transfer electrons. And so what happens is the crystal that's falling steals electrons from the crystal that gets hit. And it falls and it becomes a negative charge. It steals the electrons and keeps falling. So the bottom of the cloud has all these ice crystals that have struck these glancing blows and stolen electrons and fallen into the bottom of the cloud. Um, of course then the little positive charged uh, crystals that got an electron stolen from them uh, are repelled by the negative bottom of the cloud because they're positively charged so they rise and also these cumulonimbus clouds have a big updraft in them already um, which is part of how a thunderstorm develops uh, so you see this um, this negative charge begin to develop on the bottom of the cloud and then you get a positively charged area on the top of the cloud uh, but since the negative charge is in that bottom area of the cloud, that's why it repels the electrons from the ground beneath the cloud, and then you start to get these positive areas. Of course, the higher up something is on the ground, the closer it is to the cloud, and the more positively charged it will become. That's why it's more likely for lightning to hit something that's tall, because it's closer to the cloud, less air between them, so it's easier to push its way through the insulation of the air to strike something that's tall because it's just less distance. <coughs> so, <laughs> sorry. Uh, so you have the four stages of the thunderstorm you can read about in the book. It's pretty clear. And um, I will make another video that goes over the study guide and, um, and questions for the module. 
and then that'll be it. We'll talk more. If you have questions, call me or um, we'll talk about it in class next week.